Welcome to the Transfer Exchange Show. We are live and we are joined by a super guest today. Former England, Manchester City, uh, Liverpool and Tottenham. Uh, it's Paul Stewart. How are you doing, Paul? I'm all right. Thank you, guys. How are you? All right. We're yeah. good. We're good. I'm good. Thank You're you. Good, and, and of course, we're joined by our Chief Scout, Steve K. How are you doing, Steve? Yeah, very well. Uh, good morning, Kieran. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, uh, Everybody out there, thank you for getting up. Um, for, for me, is this an ungodly hour? <laughs> well, we've done it before. This is the first time. Paul, Paul has hit four or five coffees. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping, I'm hoping he doesn't pass out halfway, halfway through. Ready, so, uh, but let's go. Um, we're going to be talking about Paul's career in football. Um, and uh, yeah, let's go. Um, so, Paul, uh, you, you started off. Um, as apprentice at, at Blackpool, um, this was the first. This was the first club um, you moved to after uh, your horrific ordeal um, that was that was documented on the on the, on the BBC recently. Um, how how did you feel once once you finally moved away um, from 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 the abuser? Um, it's a difficult one, really, because the, the effects are still. Uh... They're still there for all to see. You know, it's it's something that you don't speak about, and uh, it makes it very difficult then to to carry a burden such as that. But I, I, one thing it didn't do, it didn't weigh my desire to play football. My desire was always to be a footballer, and despite what happened to me as a child, I I was determined to to realise my goal. So. I remember I was probably angry uh, as an apprentice. Uh, my, my my record shows that you know descent and sending offs were uh, commonplace, uh, but I think it was because I was just I had this pent up anger because of uh, what had happened to me. Yeah. So w when you when you finally got to Blackpool and started playing, was did you ha find that you had um, was it hard to trust other coaches or? Or did you, did you just get straight into it and it was like a, a way of sort of forgetting things? Yeah, I mean, football, and, and I think I've said this quite a few times, was, was my safe haven. So when I was on the pitch, I felt safe because no one could touch me in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, hurting me off the field. So I found that, that playing football was, was more like a safe space for me where I had mm -hmm. no no outside influences only what i was doing on the pitch so um that's that's where i tried to channel uh, my anger my energy um but you know when you talk about trust i think when when many abusers will tell you that uh, one of the effects of the abuse is that you just you you just don't trust anyone you just mm -hmm. um, your lack mm -hmm. of trust for anyone and and that that goes goes deep in, into with your own family, you know. Um, it, it really does affect your your personality, your, your ability to show emotion and love and affection. It, it, it really does damage it and take it to the uh, to the roots. Yeah. Um, so did you find yourself being a bit cold? Maybe maybe that gave an element of sort of coldness on the pitch as well. Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, you know, it depended. But like I said, when you're an apprentice back in back in them days, you had to grow up really quick. Yeah. Um, you know, you went straight into a man's world. Uh, it isn't like where you have your under sixteens, mm -hmm. under seventeens, under eighteens, and they're they're all together. You are thrown in at the deep end with 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 adults, and mm -hmm. you're sixteen, seventeen, and I was I'd started playing for the first team, so I had to grow up really quick but also mm -hmm. you had to make sure that you didn't show signs of weakness because if you did then you get you get swallowed up in the game um, yeah mm -hmm. i didn't think there was anyone that i could have gone and spoken to no i didn't feel that, that there was that support network within the clubs uh, that you could have gone and spoken to somebody about about your ordeal and then when you get older guys uh, and when i started on my way to city and and, and spurs in Liverpool, it's embarrassing, you know, to sit next to uh, one of your colleagues and tell them what happened to you. So you end mm. up, what you end up doing is carrying that burden forever and a day. Yeah, because you, you don't know how they're going to respond to it. And like you said, you feel embarrassed. 
Yeah, you feel shamed, you feel embarrassed. You know, it's words that we use, but it, it's fact, you do. Um, mm. And you shouldn't do. You know, it's yeah, your burden. It isn't your burden to carry, but unfortunate they are the some of the uh, ongoing effects of, 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 of abuse and and i think that's you know i think that's any nature of abuse any farmer mm -hmm. you know there are many many ways in people you know with the way people abuse people whether that be verbally racially you know what what they don't understand it i think is the effect it has on that person um that they're targeted and if they did they probably would think twice yeah yeah in it, like you said it in in, in in any sort of way it's going to stick with that person for life it's gonna it's gonna change them in a way yeah yeah and uh, and, and i always say it's it's better as soon as you can talk um about it to anyone a loved one a friend a relative i think that's then when the healing process starts mm -hmm. but you know you don't get better overnight it's not yeah. like a, mag a magic pill it takes a lot of talking a lot of people listening a lot of crying um you know mm. all these these emotions you go through but it is the start of a healing process when you talk to somebody mm -hmm. so as a as a player when you was younger um was there any players you kind of looked up to any kind of players you kind of modeled your game on i suppose i used to go and watch man united because <laughs> i was I was born in Manchester with Ensure. Mm. You were either red, you were either red or blue. Um, yeah. I was a red. I used to go to the games with my older brother. And I used to watch people like Joe Jordan, Pancho Pierce, and Stevie Coppel, you know, right. uh, the late Gordon McQueen, Martin Buckingham. Mm. They, 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 but I'd probably say the, the one that I, I, I wanted to be, I wanted to aspire to be, was Joe Jordan, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, I just thought he was quality. Um, he was, <coughs> he was, he was tough. That's for sure. Yeah, very tough. But yeah, I, yeah. following <laughs> following that team, it was a really I thought it was a really good era. And you know, they were much like what I say Spurs are as a team. You know, they can go and win a cup, but they weren't able to sustain a challenge for the league back then. You know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But as as a as a attacking side, they had a lot of flair <coughs> with the two wingers, God Neil and Stevie Coppel, and and you know great players that uh, that went alongside them. But they just didn't have the sustainability to win the, the old first division that it would have been then. Yeah. So how did it feel uh, getting that call from 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 Manchester City when they come knocking? Uh, being a red yourself, put that aside um, and. Well, of course. I mean, you know, it was it was an honour, an honour to have. Yeah. You know, they they you know, there's quite a long backstory to me joining City. They came in for me um, when they were they were struggling for goals. I was banging them in at Blackpool. They came in for me. I went over to see them, and uh, they dragged me to through the press first, and holding a scarf up with a six shirt on. Then I went for this. <laughs> <laughs> then I went for this medical. And I kept thinking to me, I haven't even spoken to the manager yet. What, what's happening here? <laughs> anyway, after that, I go into the manager's office and the upshot is he offered me about 150 quid more than I was on in the third division at Blackpool. Um, right. I, do you know what? I, 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 I think I was on 250 pound at Blackpool. So you're talking about 400 pound, um, yeah. which mm -hmm. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying it's nothing, but you're going to a first division club. So for some stupid reason, I went, uh, I was thinking about a little bit more than that, actually. <laughs> it, That's what you said to him. Yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> what were you doing? <laughs> anyway, they, they went, I'm sorry, son, we can't, back and forth, so we can't pay you anymore. So I had to walk out the stadium, <laughs> get in the car, drive back to Blackpool. <laughs> And then the next mm. morning, back of the back of the uh, papers was greedy Stuart. You know, <laughs> I, I thought my world, yeah, I thought my world had um, fallen in. But and uh -huh. I, say, I, I mean, I mean this in the best way. They kept they kept losing, and they needed a goal scorer. So I uh, they ended up coming back for me and agreeing to. And it was only five hundred pound a week that I wanted. By the way, it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. 
Yeah. Because they because they kept losing, they came back in for me and just I remember I was playing up at in Darlington. Uh, we beat Darlington six one. Um, me and my co striker Eamon O'Keefe scored three each. When I got mm. when I got in the tunnel at the end of the game, uh, the manager of City was, was there and uh, he said, uh, we'll we'll pay you the money, son. So I signed the next day. But yeah. it was, oh, but you, I mean, you had you had a fantastic partnership at Black, uh, Blackpool, didn't you, Paul, with yeah. um, with Mark Taylor? So um, I, I would have thought you would deserve that money. Uh, was he your first ever partner? Partner, partner as a no, a, as, a, a as a striker. No, it's a lad called Dave Bamber. Uh, oh, big, oh okay. big, tall, six foot five. Um, I think he went off went on to, to play at Coventry. So he would have been. I had quite a few. I had, um, I had we had a lad called Damon O'Keefe that came from Manchester. Came from Everton. I don't know whether you remember uh, Eamon. Um, yeah. Uh, so so they they it was always sort of an, an older head that they put me with. Uh, I was literally because our boss was Sam Ellis. Uh, I was literally told to hit the channels, and that's mm. what I did. Um, and then we, they'd play a natural goal scorer with me because that was my problem. When I when I when I first started playing as a striker uh, uh-huh. in the team, I wasn't scoring enough goals uh, to warrant that that striking spot. You know, mm. you, as you, as you know, managers are looking for 25, 30 goals a season from a, mm. a number nine, and I, I I might have been up there with assists <laughs> if they'd have done it back then um, yeah. in terms of mistakes, yeah. but. But goals were looking like twelve and ten a season, you know, which yeah. which which don't get you a move. And then it just one season, it just clicked. Um, yeah. And I. What do you think that was? Yeah. yeah. I, I, do you know what? It was hard work. If I'm honest, I, I used to yeah. stay on the training field and practice fishing. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and just, that. You know, when everybody went off, I'd be shooting, or, or, or the manager, mm. I'd ask him to stay out and cross for me or anything. So I think it was. It was a mixture of just just hard work, really, and and and, and it paid off. You didn't yeah, start you, out you, as a as a mid uh, forward, though, did you, Paul? You you started out as a, a defensive no, midfield player. No. Uh, how I did that come for, about? I was always a forward, to be honest. I only oh, you went was? back. Yeah, I only went back into defensive midfield when uh, when I was at Spurs. Uh, when uh, we had a couple of we had a couple of sendings off in in two back to back games. And I was, of course, playing up front with Gary Lineker. And out of the two of us, he was never going to go back into midfield and no. do the, <laughs> do the, <laughs> do the hard draft. So Venice put me back there. And I think on the first game, we played Luton and I scored. We won 2 1 and I scored both goals from midfield. And then I All got right. man of the match with the, with the next game on TV. So naturally, I, uh, they left me in there. And of course, I was playing alongside Paul Gascoigne, you know. At the time, uh, one of the best players on the planet. So, for me, it yeah. was just get the ball yeah. and you know knock it to him and let him uh, let him do his magic. And then people sort of started to say, "Oh, this Stewart can play in midfield." Well, no, it wasn't. I was really a minder for Gaza. Get the ball, give it in. He does all the stuff, and, and it mm. worked for us both. Yeah. Mm. So when you was at Man City, your goal scoring record that they came in for you and and they, they got what they paid for. Is it like? One in, well, uh, one in well, two. Yeah, but I, this that season they were in the first division, but they were they were languishing at the bottom. Um, mm-hmm. That's why they came on in for me. In, when I went, it was about six games to go. I didn't score the goals to keep them up. Um, the manager then got the sack, and we brought a lad in called Mel Machin. He mm-hmm. was supposed yeah. from Norwich. And Mel's first buy was a striker called Tony Adcock. We already had him, Ray Berardi. So that pre-season, for me, I thought the writing's on the wall there. He doesn't fancy me as a player. He's brought mm-hmm. another striker in. Imbe was always going to be on the team sheet first. And fortunate for me and fortunate for Tony, he got a, a serious knee injury um, in pre-season. So mm-hmm. he had to play me. And yeah. I banged the goals in straight away. So he couldn't leave me out then. Mm-hmm. Went, went on tour to like Sweden and Norway and Finland. And I was just banging goals in for fun. So when we got back, I became like the first choice striker. And as, as you say, it was one in two, one in two. I think I scored 30 goals in all competitions. 
well, that season. And, and no, nobody had done it since Brian Kidd. So, mm. you know, it, that that's really how it, how it transpired. I mean, because I could have been sitting on the bench, in all honesty, yeah. If, yeah. if Tony hadn't done his, uh, his knee in. You hear so many stories about that in football. It's, it's, it's a lot about timing as well. It is, mate. Yeah, and, you know, whatever anyone says, that, that look it plays a big role in your in your footballing career, whether whether it is about somebody getting injured, whether mm-hmm. you know whether you're having the best game when the when the team that wants to sign you is the manager's there watching. They'll send a scout yeah. a few times, and then the scout will report back to the manager, or they did in them days. And then it was the manager that would come, and that was you know if he didn't play well that day or something went wrong, then he may go away, and you you might not get that move. So. There are a lot of, um, you know, things that have to align for you to 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 get a good and go through football uh, with a good mm. career. It's not it's not all just about ability. It's right, like yeah. you said, it's right right place, right time. Uh-huh. Yeah. So the, your your partnership up at City was that was that was that a good was that a good partnership up top? Yeah, I mean, I, I played with um, with Imre Berardi. Uh, he, oh, you know, he'd been at Leeds and some big clubs. Um, mm. We had we had a young team, you know. Uh, when when we went out of the um, out of the first division, the old first division, um, a lot of the bigger players, if you will, had left, and we we had a crop of youngsters come through that were really good. And when I talk about, I'm talking about um, Paul Simpson, David White, uh, Paul Lake, um, mm. Steve Redmond. Uh, Ian Bright, well, yeah. these were good. These were good young kids, um, and you know we had a lot of pace about us. So we mm. um, we did well, but we just needed that um, a, that bit of experience. Mm. And, I, and I think I think we would have pr- probably gone straight back up. But what happened to me was that, that, that a few clubs came knocking on the door, and uh, mm. you know I think City fans thought for a long, long time that I, I went in and asked for a move. And, I, you know, I was a Withing Charles lad. There was banging goals in the, you know, the the adulation I had off the supporters was great. But mm. somebody coming out of the chairman, mm. Peter Wales, 1.7 million. So he, yeah. he, mm. he, he accepted it, but then sort of manipulated as if it was me that had uh, asked to go when I, I didn't yeah. ask to go. But, uh-huh. you know, 1.7 was a lot of money. For, for Manchester City back yeah. then, and that, and I, mm. I went, and, I went, and had talked with uh, Everton and Spurs, but uh, but Terry sold Spurs to me. It's, yeah. it's, was mm. it his charisma? Is a is it is a very charismatic yeah. character? Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, I went, I went to to have talks with Everton, and I went to mm-hmm. their ground. Don't get me wrong, it's an imposing ground. I go down to mm. London and I'm in a five star hotel with champagne on the table when Straight I go away. When I go, <laughs> when, I go, <laughs> when I go to uh, Terry. And then you know, it's just he had this I don't know, it was like a man with, with money just to, to throw away and he was buying this player and that player and it just Yeah. I never thought I never thought it through, if I'm honest, but I just thought I, you know, I w I wanna play here. Uh, mm-hmm. Going down, going down south from a northern lad was quite challenging at first. If I'm honest, um, and it, I, I, it was difficult uh, in terms of settling, you know, um, mm. because it is, you know, whatever anybody says. Uh, for me, there is a north and south divide, and you go down south, and I, I find, yeah. that, you know, life is so fast. You know, people yeah. just, you know, they get on with their own stuff, and you know, yeah, I, I'm not saying mm. that they're not friendly, but it, it's a lot. We're not. More. No, they're not. <laughs> we're not. No, we're not. I, I mean, you, you, you two said that, not me. I've still got I, friends down there. I do get it. You, you, you go up north, you say hello to people, and you get hello back. You go, no, you go no. down south, you say hello to people that you don't know, and it's like, okay, what do they want? So, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, from the yeah. East End, I'm from the East yeah. End, and they're all, they're all lovely people. They say hello in the yeah. morning. How are you? All my... The most, is, that the my West, second... is that the West Ham? Is that the West Ham? That's the West Ham area. Yeah, but all my yeah. friends are from up north. Loads of friends from up north, and it's yeah. totally true. <laughs> so I struggled. Totally basically, I, I did. I struggled to to settle uh, initially, but then you know, like I say, 
Uh, I think I scored 12 goals in my first season. Second season was when uh, when the two sending offs uh, happened early on in the season. So um, they stuck me in midfield and, and things started to, to happen for me. Mm. So uh, I, uh, like I say, I had some great players alongside me. You know, you got Lineker, Waddle was playing. We had some fantastic yeah. Gary Mabbitt. Mm. We had some great players. We had brought a lad yeah. in from Barcelona called Naeem. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, we right. remember I him. Tell you, remember him had, well. <laughs> yeah. I think you're, you're remembering for diving, I'm guessing. But he no, I remember him for no, scoring no, no, no. Cup winners, <laughs> Cup <laughs> final. Halfway <laughs> <laughs> yeah. line, yeah. It was there. I, I was there. It was you. <laughs> yeah. It was great, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I was a little kid. I was, I was well upset. <laughs> what, what was he like playing with Paul, uh, Paul Gascoigne? Paul, mate, it was just, it was just on a different planet. I think I alluded to it earlier. Um, he just could do everything. You know, mm. pe when people mm. look at a complete midfield player, he could tackle, he could work up and down, he could go past players. More importantly, he could score goals. But he, he could, he could make things happen with the ball as well, and. You know, there's, mm. a, there's, a, there's a long, long debate, and, and I think it will rumble on forever with Spurs, of who, was, who was the real king of White Hart Lane. Was it Glenn or was it, um, was it Gaza? Mm. Um, you may get some of, some of the players, well, like, I know you will, from Glenn's uh, era saying it's him, but for me, Gaza had everything. And yeah. It's like I said to you guys, for me, I, I had the easiest job, I guess, in football because... I knew my job was to get that ball by any means mm. and give it to Gaza, uh, let him go and do what he wants and just protect the back four. Uh, yeah. and, it, and it sort of worked, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've be, become sort of his minder. But then then things started to happen for myself. You know, I probably got, gained confidence in that role and I, I, I expressed myself more. So I sort of built into it, but I'm not so sure I would have, I would have done as well had Gaza not been alongside me, if I'm honest. Yeah, and it looks like yeah. some of the goals that you scored, you built up a good partnership as well, because it was like yeah. it's, it, it'd always find your head. Mm. Well, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't bad at heading the ball. Um, but, yeah, like you say, you know, from dead ball situations, you could put it on a situation. So I played in a mm. game against Derby County, and in mm. goal was the then uh, England goalkeeper, Pete Shilton. And we beat him 3-1. We beat him 3-1. And Gaza scored three free kicks from the edge of the box. <laughs> That's how we beat them. <laughs> and, you know, he put, each one, he put each one in a different place. That's, that's how good he was at that, at that, at that stage. Uh, and, yeah. and what kind of things did, was he did? Uh, you must have seen some things in training from him and Waddle that you just didn't see in the game. But they were just like, because it's in training, yeah, it's mean, different. You see everything. Do you know the difference between, I guess, uh, Waddler and Gaza was, mm -hmm. and people that probably don't know this, but Gaza Woods, he was the hardest trainer, I think, at the club. Yeah. Once the once the first team had finished training, you you, you liked of Waddler and um, and Lynx, uh, they would they would be off, showered, home. Gaza would then go and train with the reserves. When the reserves had finished, he'd go and train with the uh, with the kids. He was the wow. hardest trainer uh, at the club, mm -hmm. and sometimes to his detriment because you know it can be tiring. You know he's playing uh, four or six games a season, and it, it, not including cups. But he just couldn't. You couldn't stop him. He, he had this. You know, he had this desire just to play and train and train. Yeah, that, but like you said, it's part of. Your, your your one of your best seasons you had was when you've really put it in the training ground and and although he had exceptional talent it's it's that drive that has where he's training extra that pushes him over the edge that gives him them few percentage. You're right. If, you know, people think that and and there is natural ability out there. We know that there's natural ability. Mm -hmm. We only only got to take uh, Ronaldo for instance. Look at him. Yeah. He trains. He works his socks off, and he's got great ability. So if you put them them two things together, you, you, you've you got the perfect footballer, in my opinion. Somebody mm -hmm. that trains like they play, works hard, works on the game, 
and then they've got an exceptional uh, bit of ability. You've got the yeah. perfect medicine then for <clears throat> for what what is the greatest player or one of. Yeah, yeah. Paul, you went back to to Blackpool, uh, and I see it might probably one of your greatest seasons <clears throat> uh, in the FA Cup, and, and that season yeah. you went on to go to play at Wembley. Was was that one of the greatest days of your career? I remember that goal. I can see that goal yeah. now. I, I tell you what it was. <laughs> we came back to Blackpool, and it was the coldest, windiest, rainiest, typical Blackpool day um, <laughs> that, that, that you could have. Uh, the game itself, it could have gone either way. You know, the conditions were that bad. It could Blackpool could have beaten us, or uh, and what transpired was Gaza threw it in the box. Um, I think it's Lynx headed it down, and I just swung my left foot. I think I think it went in off my shin pad, mm. guys. But it was a one. <laughs> they got, it's, it was, it's a goal's a goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but you, you don't yeah. admit that at the time, do you? Yeah. <laughs> everything, everything I meant. I caught that you know, perfectly. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, from from there, I guess you know, it's fair to say I think Gaza took us all the way to the final, single handedly, mm. almost with with his great goal in the semi-final, some some of the goals in the uh, the other rounds. Um, and then, of course, came the uh, the final day. And do you know what? The, the, the FA Cup was a revered trophy then. Um, yeah. Every footballer wanted to play in an FA Cup final, win an FA Cup winner's medal. Uh, uh -huh. I was no different. Uh, it just had so, so much emotion uh, to the game. Gaza was going off to, uh, to Lazio. Um, mm. I think Brian Clough had never won that domestic competition, the only one he hadn't won. So there was sort of, it was the Gaza Clough final or, or that's what it was supposed to have been. But as we know, Gaza did, uh, went into yeah. a rash challenge and uh, and did his knee in, uh, yeah. which, you know, I, I, a lot of a lot of the lads, I could see the heads go down and the shoulders sort of slump because you know, he, he, you know, he couldn't continue. They then went one nil up. I was just like, I've, I've been through so much in my life. Uh, yeah. I was like, I, I'm not just going to give this up early because Gaz has gone off and I'm going to uh -huh. do everything in my power mm. to try and try and turn this round. Fortunately, um, I got the equalizer, but what, once we got the equalizer, there was there was going to be only one winner because we'd started mm. to get on top in the game and yeah. you know, we we felt as a team that there was only going to be one winner uh, and unfortunately you know thanks to Des Walker um, we <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we, we you know we got the winner and, uh, and, and won and won the won the trophy which was it was a fabulous day I mean the weather in Wembley do you know what? I look at Wembley now and it's not my favourite and I'm probably because of my age, maybe I don't know, but yeah. when Wembley was all, all about the twin towers for me, and going yeah, it's down lost its character. Wembley Way, yeah, mm. going down Wembley yeah. Way, and you know the, the fans are lying in the streets. It, it was it was just magical. I don't mm. see that. I don't see that with the with the new Wembley, although it's a state of the art, as they say, stadium. But I would have loved to have just just freshened up the twin towers or kept them in mm. some capacity. Uh, I think the two yeah. hills out there now, uh, just off the motorway. They tell me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Which is a shame, uh, you know. Yeah, it is, it I mean, is a shame. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, what was it like scoring that goal? Then, what was the adulation like? What was the feeling like? Well, it, it, to be honest with you, it was great. Golden simply because <laughs> um, I was my momentum. I scored it at our end where our fans mm -hmm. were. The shot. And then the momentum took me over the advertising hoardings and right in yeah, front see that. Of, <laughs> yeah, pretty, yeah. right right in front of our you know fans adulation and and you know the i guess no better feeling no better feeling you can't reproduce no. it i mean no, I, you no. when, I, when, I, when i talk about reproducing you know what football was for me when we used to play at three o'clock and you were stood in the mm -hmm. tunnel at five to three and you can hear the crowd, whether you're playing at home or away, you can hear them and they're, they're waiting for you to go on the pitch. And it makes yeah. you, it makes you the hair on the back of your mm -hmm. neck stand up. 
It's it's yeah. just that feeling of I know we don't play many three o'clock games now, certainly in the Premiership, do we? Mm. But for me, mm. that was what football was: three o'clock kickoffs, five <clears> to three in the tunnel. You know that the crowd mm. are either baying for blood or they're going to sing your name, and and it was just a, a feeling that you could not you could not replicate. So mm. so when it was when he was off the pitch was when everything started to hit you. It was downtime. You didn't have that buzz. Um, so it was sort of a massive yeah, come down from that. Well, to, for me, I was I was I was a master at playing a role um, mm. as an actor, you know, with a cloak and mask on, and looking like I was enjoying the trappings mm. of being a top footballer. That life was great. Behind closed doors and inwardly, I was dying, you know. Mm. Um, and I think I said on the documentary, that, you know, I, I felt like an empty soul. Um, everything was a struggle. Um, so I started to to self medicate on drink and drugs, just mm. you know, just to get that feeling for however long away. You know, the dark thoughts, the the suicidal mm. thoughts, they just they just consume you. So that's how I started on the downward spiral into drink and drugs. Which <laughs> once you come down off them, you feel twice as bad. So it mm. was just getting compounded mm. and compounded, and you know, the thoughts of suicide became more and more, you know, in my mind. Um, and that, that you know, that's why I then have to go back into the drink and the drugs because. It just became a brings you up again. Yeah, mm. bring you back up, and and and, yeah. and you frightened. You frightened of the downtime. Yeah, you, you know. So you was it? Was you, very, you. was you very alone at that time? Was you very alone at that time? Was it? Did you have? Yeah, any, yeah. I mean, I you know. Sorry. Did you have friends around you, or was it you was just sort of isolating yourself? To be honest, the friends the friends I had around me, I guess, just wanted to socialise with you because you were a footballer. They they'd be doing yeah. drugs, you'd be doing drugs. It would, do you know when I look back, were they friends? Probably not. They were just somebody mm. that mm. did what I wanted you to to do uh, at the time when I was in self destruct mode. So, you know, my, my my wife had not settled either, uh, so she moved back north. I'd, I'd actually gone and asked Terry. If a club from up north comes in for me, um, I want to go back home. That was a, a year into the uh, year into my contract at Spurs. Anyway, my wife, my wife uh, came back to Blackpool, and I said, "You know, I, I, I'll travel. I'll do. I'll, you know, I'll do whatever." Because she just was was so so unhappy down there. And uh, when she came back, sort of on the field, my my uh, my career started to take off. So. Um, you know, went on to, as you say, win win the, the FA Cup play for England. And then, you know, what should have been a perfect scenario, moving to Liverpool ended up being a living a living, living hell for me because of, not because of the football club, but because of what I was, what I was doing off the field, you know. I was, I was, I was taking drugs almost every day when I was at Liverpool. So what was this before training? Was that just to sort of get, get up in no, the morning to get you motivated? Training. I, I think it'd be more afterwards. Afterwards, mm. I'd go socialising, <clears throat> drinking, taking drugs. I wouldn't be getting home till four and five in the morning, and then I'm going out. Wow! At, 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 at like nine yeah. in the morning to to go to training because I travel from Blackpool. And do you know, when I look back, one can It's impossible to be at the top of your game when when you're uh, living that mm. sort of lifestyle. And, yeah. But for me. For me, again, it was just the, you know, I just wanted the pain to go away. If it, I, I don't know whether that makes sense, but, you know, I'm yeah, not does. talking, I'm does, not talking p- physical pain. I'm just talking about, mm. you know, pain as, as in uh, unhappiness and darkness and, you know, all the mm. things that the, 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 the abuse sort of le- leaves you to deal with when you become an mm. adult, which I think don't think many people realise that. I, I think... People think that once a uh, once uh, a child is abused, once it stops, it stops. Invariably, I'd say that's when it starts because you have the the, the, the beginning of your problems, and you cannot mm. control them. And, and and the damage it does, it's not just to yourself; it's also to the loved ones around you. Your actions, no. you know. I, I'm I'm going missing most of the time. My wife and away, and the kids 
or wondering where dad is. I'm missing for a special birthday. I'm coked out my head or drunk yeah. as as anything. Um, and, and that's, you know, the impact it has on your family is far outreaching. Is that because yeah. you, you're you're thinking about these things in your head, and you but you don't want to speak to people about it, and it's just it's just eating you well, up. You, you, you don't feel, yeah, it's eating you up. You can soothe by it, but you know you think you're dealing with it at the time. You think you're dealing with it, but what you're doing is you're just in self destruct mode. You think you have put it to the back of your mind when really you don't. What it does, it manifests itself in other ways, and it comes mm. out in your actions and the devastating things that you 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 do. Um, and and it, it's 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 really difficult once you get on that sort of train of self destruct. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's it, it's it's just continuous, continuous. So, Paul, you did you just like did you you know while you was at Liverpool uh, did, around that time in your career, did you just wake up one morning and think, no, I've got to stop this? What what point of your life was was that? And I think I think you know I, I probably. My wife was probably going to divorce me because of how I was. Um, my career was going down the pan. Um, mm. So we both, myself and my wife, uh, went to the doctors. Uh, and then I got help for the drug addiction, but I still didn't address what had happened to me as a child. It was just mm. for yeah. the drug addiction. But, you know, I was four years at, uh, four years at Liverpool. I played 32 yeah. games, I think. Um, I went on loan most. Um, to Palace, to Wolves, and to Burnley, and to Sunderland. Um, and my career was going nowhere. People in the game, I'd heard, you know, about what I was getting up to. Mm. You can't hide it all, you know, all the time. So I, mm. I became possibly untouchable. Uh, so I decided that I'd, I'd get myself clean. And then Reedy, Peter Reed, came in for me for, for Sunderland. And I went and played at Ipswich, um, and, the, and that game I got injured. I got went into a tackle and did did my knee ligaments. Um, so my my oh, um, my my, I guess I I, I just thought I've, I've still got to get myself fit. Reedy said that he would come back in for me once I got mm. myself fit. So right. I I continued. I continued, I had a minor, it was only a minor, it was only a medial ligament, it was only a minor operation. It was like yeah. 10 weeks or something, bit time I was fit, but he came back in for me. And I managed to help Sunderland go into the, the, the premiership then and, you know, started to, to play a little bit, started to play again, um, but mm. kept myself clean. Um, and it was tough because I was traveling to Sunderland from Blackpool uh, but and when we were winning, Reedy would just say to me, "Come in on Thursday, um, stay Thursday, Friday, play Saturday, go home, train at home." And I, I was training at home. You know, it wasn't like, "Oh, I'm off till Thursday and I did nothing." I went and train, train, trained in the uh, in the gym, guys. So uh -huh. um, yeah, it was it was. I suppose it was life saving as well. Do, uh, do you think? Yeah. Because, uh, uh, go on. Sorry. Go on, carry on. Sorry. No, it's probably probably life saving. Really, you know, getting clean, um, my marriage, mm. uh, everything um, for a short while uh, was good. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, you know, when I finished playing, them dark thoughts, them them suicidal thoughts, and everything started to to consume me again. And I went off the rails again, where I uh, I went back into the drug route and the drink and. Uh, Again, I had to get help because I probably would have would have, wouldn't have been married. I wouldn't have even been here to talk to you guys, if I'm honest. That's that yeah. yeah. um, yeah. dark and bleak it had got for me. So, do, did you think the the being loaned out from Liverpool was a bit of a wake up call? I think so. Yeah, because you know it wasn't just the being loaned out. I was I was left training with the kids, and what I mean, oh, well. not even the reserve team. You know, and they'd bring me in on Saturday morning to train with the youth column A team and B team, the youth players. And, you know, it was probably the darkest uh, time ever in football that I had because I knew that, you know, there was no way back for me. I knew that the, the, the when even when Sooners started to not play me and then he went and Roy Evans and uh, Ronnie Moran, God rest his soul, got in charge. 
I knew there was no yeah. way back. And, mm. uh, you know, it, it, it's, all, it's all a bit of a wake-up call, guys, you know, when you, when you find... That, that should have been, and mm. it remains one of the biggest regrets of my life. That should have been... I should have played 332 times for Liverpool, not 32 times. But yes. by, by, by <clears> that time, I, I'd, gone, I'd gone beyond repair, guys. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 fully understandable. Um, but what 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 would you think helped you sort of um get over it? What not get over it? What helped you I sort of always, open up? I was, al I was always determined to be honest with you, even though I I went down them them routes that we spoke about. I was as an individual, um, I was very determined. So when mm. I when I'm determined to do something. I tend to throw up, throw myself right into it and get through it, and that's what I did with, with beating the the, the the drug habit. I started going to the gym. I was doing three hours, three hours a day in the gym, um, mm. trying to get fit again to go to Sunderland. And I was so focused, and I yeah. think when you when you look at my sort of um, what I, what I looked like when I was playing for Liverpool to what I turned up at Sunderland, I was a lot leaner, I was a lot lighter. Mm. Um, you could tell that, that 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 I was fit again, and you know that that is that is something that I, I was quite proud of. The fact that I, you know, I mm. looked like I was going nowhere. I was going to be left on the uh, in the football doldrums, and then I managed to get myself fit. Get myself sorted and play back in the Premiership for, uh, mm. for Sunderland. So, so you know, <clears throat> that was a bright yeah. point. That was sort of a brighter point in yeah. in your career, it's starting a, to get back yeah. in. Yeah, it was. I mean, and I, I say I say this an awful lot, guys. You know, I look at my my career from Blackpool right through City, Spurs, Liverpool, Sunderland. Mm. I took I helped take Palace up into the uh, into the Premiership when when Gareth Southgate was there. And I should have really enjoyed it, but I didn't. Mm. I didn't enjoy the experience mm. because I had so many mm. demons going on off the field and in my mind. I, and I always try to say to the kids that I deliver to now, because I, I do a lot of deliveries, uh, safeguarding sessions for the EFL, mm. and I try and impose on the lads to, uh, <clears throat> to enjoy the experience that they're embarking yeah. on. There's enough. Yeah, yeah. You have enough. You have enough tough times trying to to make your way as a footballer. If you've got any other issues, talk about them. And I don't care mm. how big, how small they are. I tell them that I didn't feel I had someone that I could speak to. You've got a support network. I wish it had been around yeah. when I played. So I try and impose that that you know the career can be can be enjoyed as long <laughs> as you've got issues. You talk about them because what 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 you know as a, as an academy. What can be better than, than 30 kids coming in with smiles on their faces and all the, oh, all, the thinking, all, the think, all the thinking about that day is what session they've got on, what the coaches put on, what training session. Yeah. And, and, if, and not have outside influences um, mm. affecting mm. any of that. And, and they can do that by speaking to, to a member of staff at the club now, the support network and the, the safeguarding teams that are at the clubs now. Um, mm. Give the kids that that option to to mm. talk to them at any time yeah that so is, is, paul did you did you enjoy that sort of like back end of your career i mean you was at sunderland uh stoke and and um, again 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 it was just on the uh, it seems like you did because it seems like you had a lot of appearances for them scored a few goals i enjoyed playing the football um if i'm honest got, got myself fit and playing the football but mm, it shows yeah yeah, I, I, I still I still struggled mentally off it. You know, I'd be people didn't know what I was like behind cold closed doors. Sunderland lads thought I was the biggest joker in the pack. They didn't see me when I was on my own in a hotel room, when I was back home, isolating myself from my own family because I was depressed and you know, it, it so many factors that people didn't see because I was very, very good at putting a uh, playing a role. Uh, of somebody mm. that was was happy and a joker, but it, it you know, I just wish I'd had somebody that that I could go and talk to, and, and I think, I think I'd have had a better career, and I'd, I'd, I'd have enjoyed it. That's the main yeah. thing. I would have enjoyed it. 
Exactly. And that's, I think that's the main thing. It's, it wouldn't have mattered whether you uh, didn't have the appearances for England. It's, it's, it's about enjoying the journey. It's about looking yeah, back and enjoying. It's like I said, you know, and I say to you guys, and we've talked about the FA Cup in England. I have, as you know, an FA Cup, Cup winner's medal uh, in my mm. house with, and I scored a goal. I have three England caps. They're not even yeah. on show. They're not even on show in my house. And the reason why is when I look at them, it just represents heartache and pain and what I went mm. through to have to achieve mm. that goal. So they just yeah. tucked away. They just tucked away. Mm. Yeah, Do you think you'll ever get them out though, Paul, one day? No. I don't know. No. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm still, you know, I am I am a lot better, guys. I, I, mm. I'll be honest with you. I think, I think coming forward in 2016 helped. But, do you know when when you've kept something in for so long, it isn't like switching a light on and off, and all of a sudden you're better. So I have to work, work at it. But what I do is when I when I'm when I'm struggling, I manage it better now. I manage it yeah. better than I did uh, yeah, yeah. when I used to go off the rails and do drugs and drink. You know, to me, it's not my go-to. I don't. That's not what I go to to uh, when I'm struggling. I'll talk. I might, you know, I'm, I'm not, might not be the most open, but I'll talk. And then, you know, mm. then bouts of depression, they don't come and hit you and stay with you for so long. When you see them coming on, I just talk. And then, you know, yeah. I, I, I get out of it a lot quicker than, than sometimes where, where you, you know, it's it lasted for weeks and weeks and months, uh, depression. So I, uh, I manage it a lot better now, guys. I think that would be, yeah. be the best way that I could put it. Do you think that um, there's enough things in football now to, like you speak about the safeguard, you speak about um, help, speaking with mental health, do you think there's enough in, in the game or do you think they could do more? I think the game's made giant strides in terms of uh, safeguarding guys. I mean, like I say, I work with the EFL, deliver to all the clubs in the EFL. Um, I've done some of the premiership clubs. Um but what, where, the, where the issues I think we have uh, in terms of safeguarding is it, we call it grassroots football now, don't we? Where you've yeah. got these, these teams where they've got upwards of 2,000 kids, all age groups on the book, boys and girls. And then you've got a volunteer who's probably, in most cases, been bullied into doing the job. You've got a volunteer who does the safeguarding, but that person has got a full-time job also. Mm. You can't possibly mm. safeguard 1,500, 2,000 kids um, part-time. So I think that the, um, somewhere, whether it's through uh, through the professional game, you know, the, the grassroots should be supported more. They should, they should, they should fund full-time safeguarding uh, professionals at the, the uh, grassroots clubs. Well, off the back of um, the the news that came out in 2016, and obviously, definitely, there's been previous accounts um, where they, they haven't really dealt with the situation. You'd think that the FA would sort of make a make a point of of, of showing that they're they're moving in the right direction to make, maybe put someone or make it a job um, that it's a full time job for someone. Yeah, and they are guys. Listen, I, I don't want to down any of the organisations, because they are, like I said, you know, the professional game has made giant strides in terms of safeguarding. And, and you know, I see it because, I, you know, that's what I, the field that I work in these days. So I see what, what changes yeah. have been made. It's just mm -hmm. what people don't understand what happened to me happened through a grassroots club. Yeah, yeah. he was. He, my, my abuser was a, 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 aligned with uh, or worked with a football club. But you know, it was still grassroots where where we were uh, we were groomed and abused, and you know, my worry is that that is still something that could happen because of um, because they haven't got the same and they can't afford the same safeguarding as what the professional clubs can. And that's worrying because you you know we know then children are at risk mm. because. What these people do, and I'm I, again, I'm talking on the on the wider spectrum here, guys. I'm talking about abusive, abusive people that go into clubs, people that just want to uh, abuse individuals, racial. You know, there's, like I say, there's um, 
there's there's many forms of it and these people identify where the weaknesses are at these organizations and they will infiltrate so that, so that they can abuse and that yeah they know what to look for yeah of course they do they know that they know that the, the safeguarding isn't as it should be they know that protocols are not being followed and procedures so they infiltrate and 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 you know <clears throat> this is what they're good at you know and, and believe it or not it's the people like you and me you know they're not you know these abusers uh, back then were not like in these rain mats and dirty old rain mats and no. what the me what the media portray these are these are, <laughs> these are people living amongst us yeah. Mm. yeah 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 i mean back back then you ne you never thought I mean, you have talked to my parents and that, and they say, well, you would never think um, of like some of the kids like went to training with certain coaches and other coaches, but you never thought nothing of it because it wasn't spoken about then. Um, you're, right. you're right. And and to be honest with you, 99% of the coaches did it for the right reasons and were good people. Mm. They they the small, small percentage that are, that are, that abused uh, individuals is is, is what um, what caused the issue, and they they knew, and that was why they operated in 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 that field in that uh, mm. realm, if you will, because they knew that parents didn't talk about it. They knew that kids yeah. didn't say anything because you know. I, as a child, didn't say anything because I thought that my abuser had the, the power to give and take away the only thing I wanted to be, and that was a footballer. Mm. Mm. And he knew that. So the, and he knew that. That was the he knew control. That. The, you know, it was the ultimate control that they had mm. over us uh, as youngsters was our our desire to be uh, to be professional footballers. And that, like I said to you, that never waned for me, no no matter. How much the abuse was horrendous. My desire to be a football always remained. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they took advantage of, wasn't it? The, you know, yeah. you've got yeah. when I when I, when I was a kid, all I ever wanted to be was a, a professional footballer. You would have given anything, done anything uh, to to sort of be this professional footballer. Uh, and these evil people took advantage of uh, something that these kids that really yeah. just wanted to fight with their life for so you mm. thought they were dream you know you thought they were dream makers you know because mm. uh, you you felt that they could if they wanted to pull the rug from under it because they were so in so 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 tied with professional clubs as well you know um, my abuser was 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 a coach stroke scout at, at uh, blackpool you know my road was through through him through blackpool um he was that highly rated i mean when you, when i look back the myself and i like called david barsley went for um for about 500 grand back in the in 80s um and you know that was a lot of money to blackpool so mm. do i do i think they turned a the blind eye possibly because of the amount of money that 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 these people generating in terms of, of, of selling players you know i had trevor sinclair alan wright he brought players like that through the club so you know they became really important part of football clubs because they were generating hundreds of thousands when players were being sold so they were mm. they were able to to then reap havoc through 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 the abuse that they they you know they perpetrated on 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 kids because we thought they were dream makers. Yeah, but yeah. the only reason why you would think they were dream makers is because they've given you that impression. Yeah. They, they would have put that into your head. It's not something you would have, because because they're the, they're the adults and you're just kids. You go like you said, you go there to play football. You didn't. Yeah. You wouldn't have gone there and thought, oh, this guy's the dream maker. He's through time slowly put that into your head and let you know, implied that if you don't do what I want, then I could take this away. And that's yeah, what he's done. That's what they've done. There's that, and there's also, you know, my abuser had put threats on my family. You know, and when 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 mm. I was ten years of age, and, and you know, somebody at thirty five says, "I'll kill your mum and dad and your brothers," you believe him? Trust me. Mm. Yeah. Um, he was also, you know, bringing gifts around for my brothers, my parents. We were from a council estate. We didn't have a lot of money. So, what what they did was very calculated back then. The way that they groomed. 
not just the child, but the parents, parents grandparents, yeah. and family, so that, that you you become isolated then, and you mm. don't feel that you've got anywhere to turn. You know, I was yeah. like, if I tell my dad, my dad will kill him, then I'll lose my dad, he'll go to prison. He said he's going to kill me, dad, if I say anything, I believe him. But still, mm. and, and the presents and the gifts, you know, because we could ill afford a lot of stuff. But I think the overriding and overarching reason that you don't say that is that, is that desire, that dream, and, and, and being frightened that it can be taken away. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Ian Akeley said at, at times um, that when, when these, these bits of news um, come round, it's almost like sometimes the press can feel like press can feel they're kind of that they're parading you about, um, and then once it dies down, it goes a bit quiet. Um, what 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 can what can we do to make sure that this doesn't go away and that we that we continue to 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 make this to go about so we can safeguard um, kids yeah, in, in the future? I think yeah, I think survivors um, such as myself are you know are important. You know, my, 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 I, I, when I deliver a safeguarding session to a, a professional club, I, t I tell the kids my story, you know, mm. and what happened to me. And then I go in and talk about the dangers of social media. You know, what's acceptable as dressing room banter. I remember us at Spurs, we target one individual and never ever thought of what impact that, that was having on mm. that, that, that person. So what mm -hmm. is acceptable as dressing room banter? Watch what you're doing on social media. You know, you you can you can be you know you you put a post up there um, that's controversial. You go on to mm. have a really good career. The media will fall back through that when you were 16, and 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 they will buy rate you in the press. So I yeah. try I try personally to to give them tools to help them on the journey. You know, because I, I, I'll be honest with you, when I, when I, when I start my sessions, I, I, because I'm talking to under 18s, under 23s, I say, listen, guys, I know the last thing you want to do is listen to a fat ex footballer talking about safeguarding. <laughs> but if, you give, if, <laughs> if you give me an hour, just give me an hour of your time and I'll try and give you some tools so that the journey you are embarking on, you can enjoy. Yeah. You can enjoy. That's all I ask yeah. of your time. And, you know, it, it it seems to be received really well, but in terms of in terms of um, how do we keep it at the forefront? Well, we have to pressure the organisations. We have to. What we don't want to do is become complacent and think that mm. we've we've arrived. We, we we've got everything in place and everything's perfect because yeah. that's when you're at your most vulnerable. So we mm -hmm. have to keep because what these abusive people do they are moving and trying a lot harder to access children to abuse at, uh, at clubs and and we need to make sure that we're working twice as hard to 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 combat it and that means yeah. you don't sit on your laurels mm -hmm. yeah. but in yeah, terms of definitely. how do we also keep it at the forefront i'm not so sure that, you know there's been uh, been bandied around that, that would, there should be something to maybe wembley um, a, a tribute to the ones that came forward so that when kids are going to watch football they they see it and they maybe go what's that for and then the parents can explain that this is what happened back in 2016 and yeah that will keep it in in you know in, in some way that will keep it at the forefront because we can never forget yeah. 2016 changed the old outlook of the game in terms of how we mm. how we look after uh, our players, mm. our staff, um, and that's because of, of of you know how many of us that, that came forward, whether it was uh, not waving the anonymity or waving it, um, yeah. there still should be mm. something that represents them people. Mm. So it keeps it it keeps it in the FA's mind, it keeps it in the Premier League mind. That's 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 possibly an option, but. You know, we need we need never to rest on our laurels with safeguarding because we, we will. You know, I, I say it also, you know, I don't want to turn the tally on in 20 years' time and see a glutton of individuals mm. pulling the heart out, whether it's from football, cricket, swimming, wherever it is, because yeah. we think we've got it right and, and, and you know, mm. we've, we've <clears throat> become complacent. And I say and that, I, and I, 
it has to be it has to be kept to the forefront of everybody yeah. you know we've had we've had the we've had the documentary and everybody's you know seen it and everybody's had their you know come out with their fantastic support of it but that as you just said there, are, Paul, yeah, that, that 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 can't be it you, you, you know now it's got to no, carry because... on and it's you guys know as well as I do, there'll be something else in the news next week and the documentary and everything else will be yeah. a thing of the past. <laughs> and we, we, we can't afford, I'm not talking about to show the documentary every two months, we can't let this this mm. uh, scenario be something that, oh, right, let's move on to the next thing because no. we'll forget, you know, that's all done because we need... We need, and, and do you know what? We need to, I suppose, for the survivors and, and any survivor out there, we need to keep it at the forefront. Because yeah. it to make it feel like it's worth something it. Something that we can, mm. yeah, for, for, you know, and, and I mean anyone that's suffered any form of abuse, you know, the, you, mm -hmm. you guys will know that the people on, on Twitter and Facebook and that they abuse people, you know, to, to mm. catastrophic uh, events, as in Caroline Flack, you know, whereby she's she's took her own life because mm. she was abused, you know. Mm. And we, you know, there are there are many forms of abuse that that we just need to make sure that we we don't ever ever forget, and that we are constantly trying to innovate in terms of how we stop mm. people getting through or slipping through the net so that they can uh, mm. they can abuse something yeah. mm. for me uh 100 like you said um it's it's, mm. it's it's integral that we we keep on talking about this and we we we, we take it away from being that taboo subject where it's it just just yeah. can be brushed under the carpet because it, it makes you feel awkward i think now we have to start talking about these awkward um um, situations and and not make them awkward anymore, so that so that it makes it easier for the next person who may have been been dealing with it to to speak out and and eventually to completely prevent it. Um, yeah, I yeah, think it's, I I think think it's you're, you're spot on. I think I think I think you summed it up perfectly by saying it like that. You know, um, you, you're 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 spot on in in the way that you've said. We need to make sure that you know these people feel that they can talk about it you know mm. i know it's an un un uncomfortable conversation but it's conversations we need to have um yeah because that's the only way it'll stay at the forefront mm. you know yeah uh, parents children you know coaches whoever need to have these conversations because the, you know the true fact of the matter is there are dangers out there and we need yeah. to mm. we need to be warned and we need we need to be prepared because these people won't go away. Then it's exactly. not like an illness where you give them a tablet or some medicine, you know, they're nah. not going to stop. So therefore yeah. we've got to make sure that we're at the, the forefront. Yeah. And mm. as you said, it, it's warning, it's, it's educating kids to, to be aware of these things because kids, kids are, kids are very intelligent. So if you're, if they're aware of stranger danger mm. or whatever, or, just, just be aware of these things. Just, just educate. Um, I think it will, it will help a lot of people out there. Yeah, you're dead right, guys. Mm. Yeah. Do you want to uh, tell people about this, uh, the Childline fundraiser yeah. that you're doing, Paul? That's, uh, that's yeah, the yeah. Moment. It's um, what, what, what I thought on the back of the documentary, guys, was um, <coughs> I thought to try and keep it at the forefront, but moreover, understanding that on lockdown. I know that a lot of children have been abused in some way. You know, mm. when we look at football, um, that was a small percentage of children that uh, are abused. It's normally done in the familiar home, and we mm. don't understand that these 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 kids have been locked locked up nearly or locked down, whatever we want to call it, for nearly a year, and they would have been suffering. So I wanted the, the reason why I did Childline was because I know that it's. It's a haven where they can ring somebody and talk to somebody if they're struggling, mm. you know, because mm. they can't go somewhere and talk to somebody because of the situation the country's in. And I just thought they did great work. Um, and I, I just wanted to, because of the, the documentary and the overwhelming support um, mm. that, I, that I've had myself and I know the other lads had, I wanted to try and give something back um, Via, via just raising a few quid and you know people were brilliant they've been brilliant um and, and you know 
what I thought might take a few weeks took two days or so to hit the target wow. and beyond. So yeah, and it, you know, I'm leave I'm leaving the page open. Um, you can find mm-hmm. it on on Twitter, or even you can find it on my own my own website, which is paulstewartofficial.com. And you can do, donate on there. And, you know, like I said, I'll be having a, a conversation next week with, uh, with, with the NSPCC to see, to see what I can, I can possibly do to help um, carry on fundraising because they are massively important organizations. So, yeah, but I, again, I have to thank everyone for, for the most generous donations. Honestly, it's been, it really has. It's been heartwarming and overwhelming. Uh, both. Yeah. Well, anything, anything we can do, um, whether it's trying to organise a football game against against you guys, um, getting it out there on on some of the big YouTube channels, we 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 do that. Um, as long as, as long as I get picked on my own team. Where did you not hear about about me saying fat ex footballer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't, I can't be, play football. Uh, I've I've seen some ex footballers play football. They've still got something. <laughs> it's, it might be, it might not be down there, yeah. but it's up there. Yeah, I, I see you kicking the ball around yeah. in, in your garden, Paul. You you look like you could still still got it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah walking football. The takes. With the little, yeah, with, with the little takes that, guys. I was I really kept it all, And he didn't even. <laughs> 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 all right, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, your story yeah, is bliss. is both harrowing and 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 courageous. Um, um, a big big shout out to everyone who on that documentary who had the courage to come forward. And and it's not to put anything down on anyone that didn't come forward since then, um, because. Because it must be must be a massive struggle, but um, you're not alone, and, and there's, there's always people you can talk to. Uh, the child line numbers down there, um, as Paul said, you can always find him on, on his page, and and there's, there's always someone you can talk to. And it might, it may seem hard and impossible to get out of, but it, it, there's 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 always a way out. Um, yeah, there's always someone there to listen. Um, Paul. If you've got any messages you want to say to anyone, the platform's yours. Well, just like I say, just a massive thank you to, for all the support, not just on the child line, but the, the, the messages of support that I've had since the documentary. I'm, you know, I am, I'm, you know, I feel blessed. Um, mm-hmm. Thanks for inviting me on, guys. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, yeah, thank you. Have you, have you need me to help out, or I can put you in touch with uh, some of the uh, some of the players that I know. Just, just give me a shout. Yeah, we'll do. Thank you, very um, lovely. Thanks thank you very much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. definitely. Anytime. Come on, take, take care. care. Thank you very cheers. much. Cheers, cheers Paul. Right. Thank you. Very